Good Friday evening. Sam and Chris here with another edition of the Crimson Creed podcast. Chris, we are into the uh, very first course of the first full five-day weekend of college football. That's right, five days for this Labor Day weekend. Very exciting. Um, you know, it's it, it started off interesting tonight for Miami. Um, Miami, Florida, that is, in the Confusion Bowl of Miami versus Miami. It's a fun time. Um, they're looking at 24 to 3 right now over Miami, Ohio. They are almost through the third quarter. Going to refresh this real quick and make sure giving you good times there. Yeah. Uh, Michigan State fans were flipping out for a little bit. Not sure if you saw the message board geniuses posts, um, but they were down 7 to 3 at one point in the second quarter. 17 7 now, Michigan State coming up on the end of the third quarter. And our lovely Kansas Jayhawks leading 17 to 10 over Missouri State at halftime. Uh, maybe maybe a little surprising there um, for the Kansas fan base, at least. You know, knowing, knowing how they finished up last year and the plans they've got for the foreseeable future. I know during the offseason, we saw some of the mock ups for the new athletics facilities they're wanting to put in for the football team. Um, getting a lot of funding there. Obviously, we've got the late start Stanford, Hawaii tonight as well. So a lot of good stuff going on. Um, kind of kicking us off that game last night between Minnesota and Nebraska. Um, was that not the most Nebraska run game that we've seen in the last 12 or 13 years? I'm pretty sure they're, they're building statues to Scott Frost right now to honor that legacy in honor of last night. Honestly, it that was a that was kind of a messy game. And you know, it was a fun game to watch, especially the last couple drives. You see how turnovers are really the the end all for college football games for really any football game. Uh, turning the ball over, it can and will cost you the game, and that's what happened. Through an interception, uh, they uh, fumbled the ball. I mean, touchdown pass through an interception, game winning field goal. So, yeah. And that was that was pretty that was pretty Nebraska football. I uh, I was uh, I was I remember joking with some people saying that Matt Rule is trying to a bring Matt Rule college football back and b bring Nebraska football back because uh, it was like halfway through the second quarter and their quarterback had only thrown one pass. It was all on the ground at that point, and I mean yeah, their quarterback's arm is awful, but. He he's really trying to bring back some old fashioned Nebraska football. I tell you something that's interesting about that Kansas Missouri State game that you mentioned that's going on right now. Mm-hmm. One of the reasons that's so surprising is because I don't know if he's injured. I don't know what the situation is with him. I just looked over their start. Their starting quarterback from last year, who was in Heisman talks, uh, Jalen Daniels. Mm-hmm. He's not playing tonight. It's been Jason Bean, their backup quarterback. Uh, and if you remember going into the game against TCU last year, I. Uh, Kansas only had, I think, one loss on the year, and uh, maybe two, if that, but I don't think it was any more than one, and it was because of uh, Jalen Daniels. Once he got hurt and Jason Bean took over, they won maybe one game for the rest of the year, so that could be part of it. I don't know if he's hurt, but yeah, there's... Yeah, he's hurt. Um, I did just check. He's apparently had some back issues um, through fall camp. He's been limited in practice. His status was uncertain coming into the game tonight Um, definitely yeah definitely disappointing for Kansas fans to not have that um, you know not have that presence there Mm -hmm. but sure Missouri State's enjoying giving somebody a run for their money Um, you know good good on them I'll tell you one of the things I've been struggling to get used to as a fan of the game is the new clock rules you know you, you see these guys go out of bounds see them get first downs and that clock's not hardly stopping. That that clock keeps on moving. Um, I'm sure it's nice for a lot of people that want the game to fit into its runtime window. The, there's a, I'll I'll acknowledge it. There's a very large vocal segment out there that sees the three hour runtime on the TV guide, and they want that game done by the end of that three hour runtime. Personally. You know, I'm okay with a three and a half, four hour ball game. The Texas A&M LSU game from a few years back, the seven overtime game, 
that's one I think about a lot. That was a heck of a ball game. It was a fun one to get to see. And that was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back um, and lit up a lot of the changes. But, you know, I I don't know if I'm just in the minority or if I'm in the um, if I'm part of a quiet group of fans that maybe is OK with where things stand in college football. But definitely weird to see that. Um, speaking of running clock, there's going to be a lot of running clock tomorrow um, for the Sooners against Arkansas State. Um, we've got a heck of a run game in there, heck of a running back room, one that's developed a lot during this offseason. Um, you know, getting our depth chart this week, I think it was Tuesday that the um, team put that out. Something that caught a lot of people off guard was seeing Tawi Walker and Marcus Major taking alternate snaps for the first team and Javante Barnes sitting second string or third string, depending on how you want to read the depth chart there. Um, you know, splitting second team reps basically with Gavin Sawchuk. Um, Barnes obviously had a heck of a year last year, solid year. Tawi Walker, same thing. He he really burst onto the scene late. Um, he's shown a lot of promise. And from what Coach Venables has said um, through the offseason, sounds like he's really developed well. He's been in the right um, right situations, taking advantage of the right opportunities, and he's doing things right there on the team, being the leader that they need. So, you know, props to him. He's a junior. He's He's got some experience, and he's got some momentum carrying over from last year. I'm going to be excited to see him. I think the offensive line shows up. I think the run game's there. Um, Gabriel's going to get his feet wet early, obviously. Dylan Gabriel will um, – he, he's going to get a, a deep ball or two dialed up. I, I have a feeling we're going to come out on that first drive and see at least one on the first, um, heck, even the first series, first set of downs there. Um, how are you feeling about our run game and the rest of our offense tomorrow night? What are we in store I'm feel, for? I'm feeling pretty good. Uh, real quick, just to kind of go off of what you just said, if you remember correctly, last year, the very first play of the season was a deep shot at Marvin Mims. It was overthrown, if I remember correctly, or maybe underthrown. I just remember it missed. But very first play of the year, we were going right down the field. So I know Jeff Levy and Dylan Gabriel are going to dial up a couple of those. But no, I'm I'm kind of with you. I was surprised with uh, Tawi Walker and Marcus Major. That's no shot at them. I mean, they're they're both really good backs. We haven't seen Tawi Walker too much, really. Marcus Major, we we we've only seen glimpses of him, uh, whether it be due to academics or due to injuries. We we've never really seen him play a full game. But whenever he's out there, he's doing great. He's averaging close to five six yards a carry every every time he's out there, going all the way back to the 2020 season in that uh, four overtime thriller against Texas. He had some nice carries in that game. Uh, in the 2021 game against Texas Tech, he came onto the scene late in the game and had some nice carries. Same for in the 2021 Alamo Bowl against Oregon. Uh, early in the season, they were before Eric Gray really exploded. There were people calling for Marcus Major to replace Eric Gray because Marcus Major is doing better. I'm sure we all remember him breaking the ankles of some Kent State golden flashes on that one touchdown run he had against them. But Tawi Walker... From from what I've heard, he's basically a smaller Ramondre Stevenson. He he has the size of your typical running back, but he has the power of Stevenson, who was so difficult to tackle. So, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing him run the ball a lot. I'm looking forward to seeing Marcus Major run the ball a lot. Marcus Major was a four-star coming out of high school. And one other thing, I've got the depth chart pulled up on here. The, the offensive line. We have a really tough, big, and experienced group. The experience is the main thing I'm excited about there. So just our starters. Left tackle, Walter Rouse. He's 6'6", 323 pounds. He's a redshirt senior. Starting left, starting left guard, Savion Bird, six foot five, two hundred ninety six pounds, redshirt sophomore. Keep in mind, at six foot five and two hundred ninety six pounds, he is the runt of the litter. He is the smallest one out there, and that's that's a big boy. At center, we have Andrew Rame or Andrew Rom, uh, six foot four, three hundred five pounds, senior. Right guard, the transfer from Cal, McCade Mataillier. He's six foot four, three hundred sixteen pounds, redshirt senior. Uh, and then finally, starting at right tackle, Tyler Guyton, six foot seven, three hundred twenty-eight pounds, redshirt junior. We have a lot of 
big boys up there, and they are all experienced. They know the system. They know college football. They know defenses, and they know Jeff Levy. They know our running backs, and they know that at Oklahoma, you run the ball. It doesn't matter how many Heisman quarterbacks we've had. Oklahoma is a run-the-ball team. And so I think we're really going to see them explode onto the scene. I'm I'm excited to see Gavin Sawchuck, too. Javante Barnes, you know, anytime he goes out there, it's going to be explosive. Gavin Sawchuck, we really only saw him in one game last year, and it was great. So I'm looking forward to seeing him. But, you know, that's that's uh, that's honestly what I'm expecting from the run game. Just those big boys up front dominating the line and and then the running backs really bursting onto the scene. But I tell you, I tell you one other thing that I'm going to be interested to see, and that's that's our passing game. You talked about uh, Dylan Gabriel and dialing up the deep shots downfield. Here's the thing. We lost two of our we lost our number one and number two pass catchers from last year. Marvin Mims and Braden Willis, they together had 1,597 yards receiving. Dylan Gabriel had 3,168 yards passing, so those two accounted for almost half of the yardage. Uh, the next best receiver in terms of yardage was Jalil Farouk with 466 yards, Drake Stoops with 393. So I'm really interested to see who is going to step up. Do you do you have an idea of who do you think will step up and be that number one guy? I think Jalil Farouk is going to be a huge difference maker in that regard. Um, you know, like you said, the experience, the firepower there. Um, he's a he's a big guy, right? He he's an intimidating guy to cover out Definitely. there. I think maybe the biggest splash, um, the biggest addition to the offense, is going to be Andrew Anthony, yep. um, the Michigan transfer. I'm really excited to see him get out there. Um, he's close to Jalil Farouk's size. He th- I think he's got a bit more of the speed that, um, you know, our offense relies on sometimes, you know, whether it's been... He can fly. Yeah, yeah, whether it's been Heupel, Levy, Lincoln Riley, whoever, the consistent thing is our offense a lot of times relies on speed, um, speed of the wide receivers and the tight ends. So I'm excited to see the impact Anthony can make there. Um, I think he's going to be an exciting addition. We've all seen that clip of him at Michigan running around the left sideline, uh, taking off. So that's going to be a really, really big thing. And, you know, Farouk last year, 37 catches, 466 yards. So he's he's got a lot of production he's carrying over. Drake Stoops is the obvious, um, you know, senior guy, the elder statesman of the wide receiver room. Um, brings a lot of experience there for some younger guys on the team, um, but also kind of evens out the large level of experience there that we've got across the board. Um, Gabriel being the redshirt senior, Marcus Major, redshirt senior, Austin Stogner, senior. Um, you know, I'd, I can keep going down the line here of juniors and seniors. Um, Savion Bird, our left guard, who you mentioned, sophomore he's our uh least experienced starter at least by class on the offense and that's you you've got a lot of upward mobility and a lot of potential when your least experienced person on the offense is a second year left guard that leaves you a lot of room um what else was interesting to me about this depth chart just looking around it is seeing Gentry Williams in at quarterback, um, cornerback, excuse me. Gentry Williams is someone who's got a lot of speed, got a lot of playmaking ability, and he really puts himself in the right places at the right times. He's, he, he puts himself in a position to make plays. Sophomore coming out of his, uh, you know, really has the opportunity to come onto the scene big this year. Um, him back there in the secondary with Billy Bowman, Reggie Pearson, Woody Washington, um, Justin Harrington in some cases. Uh, I think Gentry Williams being more of a focal point of that second level of the defense, that's really going to be an exciting addition to have um, and a really cool change of pace for the defense. We need ball hawks out there. Um, we need guys that will 
take advantage of the opportunities that come their way. Everybody always talks about when, when somebody has a good defensive performance against a bad team, it's like, well, you know, no doubt, of course they had a good performance. It's, it's X team. You got to take advantage of the opportunities you get, right? That that's step one, because if you can't take advantage of the opportunities against a Kent state, against an Arkansas state, Missouri state, whoever you want to go there, how are you going to expect yourself to take advantage of opportunities when you're down in the home stretch of the season, playing Texas Tech, playing Oklahoma State, playing, um, you know, any other year, playing Kansas State, not this year, obviously, but um, when you get down there, how do you take advantage of those opportunities? It's by doing it the right way early. Gentry Williams is that guy. What else do you have sticking out to you um, about this depth chart, if anything? So Gentry Williams was one of the big ones, and I tell you something else that has me excited about him. He's a cornerback. He's six feet tall, something that we've struggled with for years, ever, honestly, ever since Brent Venable's departure when he left for Clemson. Uh, something we've struggled with is small defensive backs. I mean, there was a span of about two years where our best defensive back was Brendan Radley Hiles. He was, what, five foot nine? And he was our best defensive back. That is one of the reasons that we just kept getting torched in the pass game. But not only can Gentry Williams fly, like you mentioned, but he is tall. He is big. He's six foot, 182 pounds. That's going to be huge for our defense. That alone is going to be a difference maker. I tell you something that surprised me on the defensive side of the depth chart was Justin Harrington at Cheetah. And he's he's someone that all of Sooner Nation's been rooting for. He came in in the 2020 season with Perrion Winfrey. Uh, Perrion was the number one JUCO transfer. Harrington was the number 10. And Harrington had some type of injury that sidelined him the entirety of the 2020 season. Uh, he didn't get much play time in 2021, and he even re-entered the transfer portal. He he left the team. And then it was just kind of a very quiet storyline when he returned to OU la before last season. I remember he didn't make any big public announcement. It was just suddenly people saw him at practice and went, oh, hey, look at that. That's Justin Harrington. And People have been rooting for him ever since he came back to get that play time. And he beat out Desan McCullough for the cheetah position. Desan McCullough was a big was one of the big 10 defensive players of the year last year at Indiana. He showed a great ability to go after the quarterback. He shows great linebacker skills. And he's huge. He's he's six foot five, 219 pounds. I mean, that's a good size for a linebacker or for a safety, which is what that cheetah position is. It's a mix. And seeing that Justin Harrington won the job, that that honestly is surprising to me. But, you know, if if there's one thing we've learned about Brent Venables, it's that he earned it. Justin Harrington earned that job. It's not going to be anything where, well, Desan McCullough made a bigger splash in the portal. So we're going to start him and see how he goes. No, he starts the consistent players. And I've been reading up on Justin Harrington in practice. He's he's been he's been consistent. He's been good. He's been making the plays. He's been going after the ball. He's been sprinting to the football on plays. I mean that that's what you want in a player. And so that's something that honestly really surprised me. One other thing that kind of threw me off was on the wide receiver slot. It doesn't look like Brennan Thompson is going to get much play time this year. The starter out of uh, the sorry, I mean the transfer out of Texas. Granted, last year at Texas, he was a true freshman, only had one catch and went for like 30 yards. He can fly. But he transferred to OU. He is not even listed as a third string on any of the three wide receiver spots. So that was kind of interesting to see, but uh, we'll see what happens there. Uh, because because honestly. We're we're going to need all the help we can get this year. After we went six and seven last year, we're going to need all the help we can get. And I tell you one other area that I think Justin Harrington will be able to help us on that cheetah position is against the run game. He's he's a really fast player, and we're going to need some run game help against Arkansas State. I, I was doing some research on Arkansas State and how they played last year. And they were a run the ball team. I just made a post about this on the on the blog that I run, the SoonerPocket.com. Go check it out, SoonerPocket.com. But last year, Arkansas State averaged 11 yards per carry. They averaged 11 yards per carry. That is nothing to turn your nose to turn your nose to. They did just a phenomenal job of controlling 
the line. They did a phenomenal job of running the ball, getting into space, and especially because their their quarterback play was mediocre at best. And their quarterback coming into this year, his name is uh, J.T. Shrout. He comes into the year as a transfer from Colorado. He has seven career touchdowns and eight career interceptions. We know Arkansas State is going to be running the ball. The question is, how well will they be able to do it against OU's defense? And honestly, what I'm hoping for is that we don't even allow 70 rushing yards. Well, I'm with you. I hope we don't allow 70 rushing yards. I hope that for most of our opponents. Is it realistic? We'll see. Um, I think, I think the way that I expect our offense to perform with the experience and the firepower out there, our defense is going to have plenty of chances to get tackles, to get turnovers, to get tackles for loss. Um, you know, you, you give somebody enough opportunities, they're going to build up some yardage, probably going to build up 70. I'm interested to see how they do. Um, I saw something the other day about how much we've beefed up our defensive line, um, made them bigger. You know, w- watching the Florida Utah game last night, seeing Florida's defensive line, it was really almost an eyesore mm-hmm. how small that defensive line is, how small they look. They've got the one guy up there, uh, number 21. I don't know his name, but, you know, the, the camera showed him several times. That that dude is a man. But, <laughs> He's a big boy. Yeah, but the rest of them weren't very impressive. And I think that's the thing that you notice about a team a lot is the size. Um, how big is that defensive line, right? So having that, I think, is going to be interesting. On the subject of the defensive line there, one player I'm really excited to see in this first week from our defense is Trace Ford. Like I said, defense is going to see a lot of snaps. We're going to have plenty of opportunities to probably cycle through this depth chart um, in large part. You know, maybe there's a couple guys here that don't see don't see much anything Saturday. But by and large, I think we're getting through this depth chart tomorrow um, against Arkansas State. It's that kind of game where you get to Get the younger guys some experience, hopefully, in the second half. Um, Trace Ford, obviously, transferred in Oklahoma State. Cowboy fans were very gracious, as you'd expect. Um, Very. Very gracious, very supportive. No, no, they were terrible. (laughs) But um, it's going to be cool to see him there, see kind of what we've got in Trace Ford. He is lighter. I think he packs a lot of speed. Um, He packs a lot of muscle. Those are two good things to have there on the defensive end. Um, him alternating snaps with Ethan Downs, a little bit with Reggie Grimes and Marcus Stripling as well. So I'm interested to see Trace Ford, see kind of the punch that he brings to this. And going back to Tawi Walker on the offensive side, um, excited to see the development that I think the coaching staff has had the privilege of seeing this offseason. See what we can bring in. It in the run game. See if we can top that 150, 200 mark. Probably will, right? Probably will. I see this being maybe one of those 400 ish yards of offense type game um, for our offense. I think the passing game does well, run game does well. Um, you know, I don't mean to totally homer out on OU in this first week, but you know, we've got a lot of experience, a lot of playmakers. And we're going in against Arkansas State, which um, respect to them, to their fans, their team. They're a good team. Like you said, they run the ball um, well. They make that a focal point. I don't know that they're going to stand up to Oklahoma for long. But, you know, stuff happens, right? Um, let's, Let's look back to California the other night, last week, I guess, against uh, San Jose State for the lovely Trojans. Um, Stuff happens. You have trouble where you don't expect it sometimes. I don't see that happening, but, you know, if I could tell the future, I probably wouldn't be here on a podcast, Christopher. I'd be... uh, (laughs) Most likely not. I'd be in line for a lottery ticket. (laughs) You know, uh, I've got to agree with you on all that. 
and and I I think someone who's really going to help us stand up against that Arkansas State run defense is my main player to watch for tomorrow's game on defense, Danny Stutzman. Big 12 leader last year in tackles. Uh, he had 70 solo tackles, 54 assists, totaling 124 tackles. Uh, he deflected five passes, uh, sacked the quarterback three times. He didn't force any fumbles. But he intercepted two passes, one against West Virginia and then that interception that almost went for six against Iowa State. He is a difference maker, and Brent Venables has done nothing but hype him up. When you hear someone like Brent Venables talk about how good a player is, you, we, we hear him talk a lot about how players are making nice plays. We'll say we'll, – we'll hear him say, we'll see how this guy is doing. Because like last year, Jaron Canick, he was making nothing but good plays for us. And what was Brent Venables saying? Eh, he doesn't really know the defense yet. We'll, we'll, we'll see how he does. So when you know when you hear Brent Venables give someone praise, it's like when Bill Bedenmo gives someone praise. You know he means it. And Venables has talked a lot about how Stutzman has just done a complete 180 from when Venables arrived, where Stutzman didn't take writing utensils to team meetings. He now is in a position where he could lead the team meetings. He leads player run practices. He knows every defensive play where he needs to be on the field to the blade of grass like the back of his hand. And I think when you're going up against a team that runs the ball as well as Arkansas State does, that is key, having someone who can who can really control the defense, who can really lead the defense. And a lot of times that's at the linebacker position. They're commuting things, communicating things that they're seeing to the offensive linemen. They're looking back at the defensive backs and saying, hey, make sure you look over here. Make sure you look over here. He is a very vocal leader, and I think we're going to see him have a great game tomorrow. And you heard me talk about how all of Sooner Nation has been rooting for uh, for Justin Harrington, one other player that we can't leave out and I think is going to have a big impact tomorrow, the return of the tight end Austin Stogner. He was a hero for us in the Big, in the big 12 game of the year in 2019 against Baylor, catching two touchdown passes in that 28 to three comeback. Uh, he had a big game in uh, he had a big game against Texas in 2020. Uh, he might have dropped a few passes, but he also got a game tying touchdown pass in overtime. Uh, he was he was just so consistent for us. Uh, and then last year for South Carolina, he didn't have the year he did in 2020, but he had the second best year of his career. Uh, 20 catches, 210 yards. Uh, one touchdown in his career. He has 67 catches, 864 yards, averaging almost 13 a reception and nine touchdowns. He's just, he is a big consistent player standing at six foot six. That's a hard. There's no such thing as a jump ball with someone that tall. All they have to do is just kind of reach up a little bit and they're going to moss any defensive back they go up against. So I think he's going to be one of the main players to watch for the, for the offense tomorrow. He's, He's going to replace Braden Willis and how consistent he was in our passing attack. And I, I think we're really going to see a special performance out of him and him and Stutzman. I like it. I like it. Um, what's your score prediction for tomorrow? Score prediction, 52 to 10 Oklahoma. Uh, I think we are going to run the ball well. I think we are going to throw the ball well, but I don't think we're going to end up throwing it too much. I uh, we learned last year from Jeff Lebby and Brent Venables that they love to run the ball. Uh, even in close games, they love to run the ball. Really, the only game where we saw them air it out and air it out and air it out was against Texas Tech. And it worked, but wasn't our consistency. So I think we're going to see it be 52-10. to 10. Uh, We'll give up one gimme touchdown probably to Arkansas State either early in the second quarter or on one of their last drives of the game. That's about it. Solid offense, great defense. What about you? It's right. cutting out. I can't see it. 52 to 10. Are you serious? The same prediction. <laughs> it was written down. Well, we did not we did not plan that. That just that's a coinky dink. But yes, 52 to 10. I'm with you. I think going back to a little bit of what I said earlier, you give somebody enough chances, they're gonna break something at some point. But I think our defense will, you know, 98% hold them in check and we'll be okay. We'll be okay. Um, looking to the other top 25 games of the week, real quick, 
Um, give me a quick prediction on these. Um, Michigan hosting the East Carolina Pirates, the former home of Oklahoma favorite Lincoln Riley. <laughs> Who do you got here? I got Michigan probably Michigan covering the 36 blowout. point spread. Michigan in a blowout. Virginia and number 12, Tennessee in Knoxville. I think it'll either A, be a blowout, or it will be an unreasonably close game. It just depends on how their quarterback does. He's, for the most part, unproven. Tennessee's quarterback does? Uh, Joe Milton, yeah. Does Coach Prime show up for Colorado and beat the Horn Frogs of TCU? I say no. And I say TCU covers that 20 and a half point spread. I think it's going to be a pretty ugly game. I don't think either team should be ranked. That includes TCU. I know they were the runner ups last year, but they just, they lost everybody. They lost everybody. But I think TCU wins a pretty ugly game. That's fair. That's fair. Um, now, question of the week here. Number 25, Iowa, favored by 23 and a half over Utah State. Does Iowa even score 23 points? You know, they have Cade McNamara now, so maybe, but no. you, you know Kirk Ferentz. He, he, he just said that one of his favorite wins of all time was a 6-4 to four win, so no, I don't think he's even close to that. No, I'm seeing a 12-2 to two type game here in favor <laughs> of Iowa. In Six true, safeties, huh? Yeah, true Big Ten fashion. Um, don't lose to food, as they always say. Is Texas beating Rice? <laughs> Texas is going to beat Rice, yeah. I hate to admit it, but they're going to win. How close does USC's defense allow Nevada to keep the game? USC, a 38-point favorite. They were 32 points, if I'm not mistaken, last week against San Jose State. They could not Something cover like that. that despite Caleb Williams throwing for four touchdowns. Um, you know, that, that, that takes work to not cover a 31 point spread when your quarterback <laughs> throws four touchdowns. Um, and is the Heisman front runner. Yeah. That, that's a concerted effort from your defense. I don't think USC covers. I think we're looking at maybe a 48 to 17 type game there. 48 to 20. I'll say 48 to 10. I'm going to give USC's defense a little bit of credit here. It's, uh, Nevada isn't as good as San Jose State, but we'll see. You never know with Alex Grinch. Yeah. Speed D, right? <laughs> um, one more Big 12 game here. West Virginia going to Happy Valley to take on the Nittany Lions of Penn State. Penn State opened a 20 and a half point favorite on a 49 point over under. Chris, I've got West Virginia not even keeping this one close. They're gonna they're gonna lose. Penn State's gonna they're, run all over them. They're gonna lose by forty. It's gonna be really ugly. And arguably the game of the week here, outside of Norman, number five LSU at Camping World Stadium in Orlando, Florida, playing against the Florida State Seminoles. I don't see Brian Kelly pulling this one out. I think we've got an early season disappointment from the Tigers. Seminoles walk out of here with the win in a close one, 10 points or fewer separating these two teams. Jordan Travis is just too good. He's a phenomenal quarterback, Heisman, Heisman candidate this year. He will, he and Jared Verse on the defense will lead Florida State to, I'm going to go out on a limb and say a two score win here. Well, we'll see. We will see. Um, well, Chris, as always, it's been good. Um, we're sitting about 14 hours from kickoff of the Oklahoma 2023 football season. It's going to be a huge, huge excitement. Hoping for a big win tomorrow. Um, to everybody listening, thank you. For Chris, I'm Sam Knight here on the Crimson Creek Podcast. Good night. See you next week. Boomer Sooner. Sooner.